This program is presented by University of California Television. Like what you learn? Visit our website or follow us on Facebook and Twitter to keep up with the latest UCTV programs. The CAP Center is 12 years old. We had our first public event right here in the Old Vic, October 2002. The center was established to carry forward the vision and legacy of Walter Capps about the importance of democratic values and the necessity for public debate and conversation. Obviously, as a center in a public university, we are nonpartisan and nonsectarian. We seek to foster conversation on important American and global issues that are concerned to all of us. In doing so, we seek to pe bring people together from the left and from the right, but those open to debate, not at the extreme, those who constitute the vital center of our democracy. Specifically, we have several different types of programming. Most visible are our public lectures like this one, of which we do eight or 10 per year, either here downtown or at the university. Second, we offer four courses on ethics. Third, we have internship programs both here in the community and in Washington, D.C. and Sacramento, California. Fourth, we offer modest support to graduate students conducting research on ethics and or cultural literacy. I encourage you to take a look at our website. It's very easy to remember, www.capcenter, one word, .ucsb.edu. And I think you'll, you'll see you know, the vast array of topics. We also have videos there uh, from UCTV, and they will be recording this event as well. We have videos over all these years that you can plug into and see uh, with some of our well-known speakers of the past. Um, I did want to say that our next event, our next event, which will be held right here, uh, on uh, Monday night, February 10th at 8 o'clock, we will have Heidi Bogosian, who is an expert on the issues now surrounding the question of surveillance here in the United States. And the title of her topic is Spying on Democracy. <laughs> so February 10th, right here, 8 o'clock. I'd also like to recognize the presence of, of uh, Con Congresswoman Capps, and we're delighted to have her with us. And, and some members of the, of the Capps family. Now, the, uh, this, the lecture, as I said, this afternoon will be uh, videoed for UCTV. And there will, the speaker has agreed to some questions following his presentation. But we do ask if you have a question that uh, you be recognized by, he will be fielding the questions, recognized by him, and get one of the um, public phones. They'll be, a, they'll be over here? At the head of each aisle, okay. And do ask your question in the phone so UCTV can pick it up. Today is our annual Martin E. Marty Lecture on Religion in American Life. And our topic is God is not one, 
religious tolerance in an age of extremism. All of us here recognize the point of the subtitle. We do live in an age of extremism, both religious and political. And often these two collide to create strong ideologies. As Americans, we feel pulled into polarized camps on so many critical issues. And our institutions, particularly our political institutions, are all too often paralyzed by gridlock. The first phrase in the title, God is not one, is a bit more challenging, perhaps, to think about. And what does that imply for tolerance in an age of extremism? But I'll leave that to our speaker. The speaker is Stephen Prothero, a professor of religion at Boston University. He is the author of numerous books, and known especially for his book written six or eight years ago, if I have my memory correct, on religious literacy, what Americans need to know. Stephen was described in Newsweek as, quote, a world religion scholar with the soul of a late night comic. And I'm sure many of you saw that line, and that's why you're here. <laughs> that's a lot to live up to, but I think Professor Prothero can pull it off. So let's give a big Santa Barbara welcome to him. Thank you, uh, thank you, uh, Clark, and to the CAP Center and um, Leonard Wallach, who helped to uh, organize this, and other other uh, folks as well. Um, it's it's great to be uh, back at UC Santa Barbara. I was actually a visiting scholar in the CAP Center. I believe it was. 10 years ago, if that's possible. It was 10 years ago, shortly after the CAP Center was, uh, was open, and I had a wonderful time uh, here at uh, UC Santa Barbara. So it's, it's, uh, it's great to be back, and it's nice to, to see all these uh, faces here, although I can't see that many of you because this light <laughs> is very strong, but I suppose you can, see, uh, you can see me. So anyway, welcome. I know there's a lot of other things to do on a, on a Saturday afternoon, and so I'll ho uh, hope to Sunday. There we go. I'm off to a bad start already. Sorry about that. So there's a famous folk tale about blind men examining an elephant that you've probably heard. It likely originated in India before the common era, but it eventually spread to East and Southeast Asia and then around the world. And according to this folk tale, these blind men are examining an elephant. One feels the trunk and declares it uh, to be a snake. Another feels the tail, says it's a rope. Um, others determine that the elephant is a wall or a pillar or a spear or a fan, depending on which part of the body they are touching. But each insists that he is right, so much quarreling ensues. And according to the most common interpretation of this story in the West, the elephant is God. The blind men are Christians and Jews and Muslims who mistake their particular and partial perspectives on divinity for the reality of divinity itself. Because God is beyond human imagining, we are forever groping around for God in the dark. It's foolish to say that your religion alone is true and other religions are false. No one has the whole truth, but each is touching the elephant. And so concludes the Hindu teacher Ramakrishna, one can realize God through all religions. Today I want to explore this belief that all religions are one, parallel attempts to get to one reality. But uh, first I want to say a little bit about how we got going on this book project, which as Clark said is called God is Not One. And I think it really began when I moved from Georgia State University in Atlanta, where I had my first academic teaching job, to Boston University. And as I was teaching my classes at Boston University in the world's religions and American religion, 
I just noticed that my students didn't really seem to understand what I was, what I was talking about. And I think that probably the same thing was happening in Atlanta, but I wasn't enough, far enough along in my career to, to notice. <laughs> But what I noticed is that my students were giving me the look. And the look, as I'm sure you've seen, um, the look is how you look when someone says something you know you should understand and you don't understand it, but you don't want them to know that you don't know <laughs> what they're talking about. That's the look. And the look, is, the look goes something like this. And so I would say, Matthew, thinking of the Gospel of Matthew, and they would be thinking Matthew Perry of Friends. <laughs> I would say Luke, and they were thinking Luke Perry of 90210. And so I decided that it was important for me uh, to follow the old principle of teaching, you know, start where your students are. And I couldn't really start where my students are unless I knew something more about what they knew. And so I, I devised a quiz that en ended up making its way into my religious literacy uh, book that Clark mentioned. And I tried to make it sort of the simplest possible quiz. I asked them, what are the four gospels? What's the, the first book of the Hebrew Bible? What's the Muslim holy book? I tried to really think of sort of the easiest two or three questions about the world's religions that I could think of. And what I found is that 90% of my students failed, my Boston University students failed this test and really failed it miserably. I would give it to them on the first day of uh, intro to religion courses or world religions courses, those kinds of things. I had a section of the quiz where I had Bible, uh, Bible story, and a Bible character, and I'd ask them to draw a line between the Bible character and the Bible story. So I would have Adam and Eve in one column, and I would have the Garden of Eden in the other column. And if they could draw a line between Adam and Eve in the Garden of Eden, then that would be a point. And good for them. And so I had, you know, Paul and the road to Damascus, and and uh, Abraham and the binding of Isaac, and Noah, and the great flood. And you know, I got back these quizzes, and you know, pretty soon, you know, there was Abraham on the ark, and you know, Paul was being crucified, and I had some of these uh, quizzes where the students would, a number of them actually, they would just start with Jesus in the left column, and they would just draw a line to everything in the right column. I don't, I don't know exactly what they were thinking, but I think they were thinking, well, you know, I've, I've, I've heard of this guy, and you know, maybe, maybe he has something to do with, with those stories. And then I turned from, uh, from my own uh, students at Boston University to my children. I decided, you know, okay, uh, my students don't know much. How about my own kids? You know, what do they know about the Bible, about the world's religions? And I realized that I had really uh, separated out my own professional life from my family life, following really the example of my father, who was a medical doctor, who spent a lot of time when I was growing up in the hospital and in uh, training to be a doctor. And so when he would come home, he wouldn't really talk about uh, medicine at all. And I realized I was really doing something similar. And so uh, there was a day at the Lutheran Church on Cape Cod where we would go. It was called uh, Bible Sunday. And on Bible Sunday in uh, the Episcopal uh, Lutheran uh, Church of America, sorry, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America, um, you give the second graders the Bible. And this is to fulfill the baptismal promise that the godparents and the parents make that as the kids grow up, you will put the scriptures into their hands and they will somehow learn them. And um, so on that day, one of my, one of my daughters was, uh, was getting her Bible. She was in second grade on, on Bible Sunday. And I was standing up there and they gave me a Bible to give to her. It was one of these uh, children's Bibles, you know, with a lot of pictures inside and a picture of Jesus, Jesus on the cover. Um, it wasn't Jesus, of course, you know, it was a, like an American model, um, you know, white guy um, who looked appropriate, you know, he had the little cleft 
thing you have to have to be Jesus and the long hair and the, you know, all that. You know how Jesus looks. <laughs> so, uh, so my daughter was smiling. I, you know, gave her, she's very proud, I gave her the Bible. And so we left and I thought, you know, we're in the car, we're driving home, and I'm thinking, okay, you know, this is, a, this is a teachable moment. It's Bible Sunday, you know, I should talk to my daughter about the Bible, you know, see what she, see what she knows about the Bible. So I said, um, let's talk about the Bible. And she said, great. And uh, I said, why don't you tell me some Bible characters? And she said, okay, that's, that sounds great. And I said, but not Jesus, that's too easy. And so I'm driving along and she's in the back seat and you know the, the car gets very very quiet and uh, she's she's going like this <laughs> and uh, and then she coughs <clears throat> and, then, and then then she coughs again <clears throat> and then she says Tom <laughs> She says, Tom. So I, I'm thinking, okay, I'm, I'm, you know, I want her to get it right. So I'm thinking, uh, okay, you know, Thomas, doubting Thomas. You know, maybe he was Tom to his, to his friends. Um, but that was it. That was it. Jesus and Tom. So a few days later, I was talking to this Austrian colleague of mine who had just come over to the United States to teach a course on the history of Roman Catholic and Orthodox um, relations. And he was very frustrated. It was a couple weeks into the semester. He was teaching mostly students in the seminary in the School of Theology, Boston University. And he said, you know, Steve, I can't teach this course because my students don't know anything about Christianity. You know, they don't know, they don't know anything about Catholicism. They don't know anything about Orthodoxy. You know, how can I... I can't actually teach this course. All I can do is substitute for this course I was going to teach, this kind of intro to Christianity course. And, and he was thinking about the contrast between these students that he had in class, most of whom went to Sunday every day, but none of whom knew anything about Christianity, and then his students in Austria who never went to church, but knew a lot because of mandatory um, religion classes that they had taken throughout their um, public school careers knew a lot about Christianity. So he helped to solidify for me this problem that became the problem of this uh, book project on religious literacy, that America is one of the most religious countries on earth, and yet Americans know almost nothing about religion. They know very little about their own religions, and they know even less about the religions of other people. And so as I was working on that book project, I was hunting around for data. We don't have a lot of data on what Americans know. There's a lot of surveys about religion. There's a lot of surveys about what Americans believe religiously, a lot of surveys about what Americans do religiously, uh, but very little on, at the time at least, on uh, what Americans knew. By the way, um, this, the surveys on how often Americans go to church uh, the one thing we now know about those surveys is that Americans lie when they're asked about how often they go to church. Um, but, but the good thing for social scientists is that they lie at a perfectly predictable rate. So um, they always double uh, the amount. So if they say, you know, they go twice a year, they really go once a year. If they say they go once a week, they really go twice a month. You know, so it's very predictable. And we know this actually because a friend of mine got a couple million dollars to study this problem about how much Americans overstate how often they go to church. And he hired a bunch of graduate students all over the country to go to church parking lots and count the cars. So he, had, he had the smart idea. You, could, you knew per car, there's a certain amount, like 2.5 people per car. And so he didn't have to go into the churches and count the people. But they went around and they figured out it's, it's really precisely half the, um, the amount of church going than what Americans say. But I digress. I was talking about uh, what Americans know religiously. And the, the survey, surveys that I did find before I wrote my religious literacy book um, told us that most Americans cannot name any of the four gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, or John. Most do not know that the first book of the Bible is Genesis. 10% uh, think that Noah of Ark, uh, sorry, that um, Joan of Arc was Noah's wife. <laughs> um, 
Only a third credit Jesus with uh, the Sermon on the Mount. A lot of people think that Billy Graham wrote the Sermon on the Mount. And a sizable minority believe that Sodom and Gomorrah were a happily married biblical couple. <laughs> Now, after my religious literacy uh, project came out, the Pew, Pew Forum uh, in Washington, D.C. did a survey on U.S. religious knowledge. It was the first uh, survey of what Americans know, religiously, of their religious literacy, as I would say. And the average score on this 32-question uh, test was 16, so the average score was 50%, or F. Uh, the, uh, the, the, best, uh, the group that did the best on this test were uh, atheists and agnostics. They did the best. Okay, a little shout out for the atheists and agnostics. There we go. Um, Jews and Mormons also did relatively less poorly on the test. In other words, they were towards the top. And uh, Catholics were last on, the, on this test. Um, of all the Americans who were surveyed in this 2010 survey, which came almost a decade after 9-11, almost a decade after a conversation that we had been having as a country about Islam, about is the Quran, you know, a violent book, is Islam a violent religion, is Islam a religion of peace? Only half of the people who responded in this survey, who were asked this survey question, knew that the Quran was the holy book of Islam. Only half of Americans were able to do that almost a decade after 9-11. Um, only a quarter knew that Indonesia was predominantly a uh, Muslim country, although it's the country in the world with the most Muslims in the world, but only a quarter of Americans knew that. Uh, on the survey, they didn't ask whether uh, the Pope was Catholic, but they did ask um, what was the religion of the Dalai Lama, and, and most Americans did not know that the Dalai Lama uh, is, a, is a Buddhist. A lot of Americans thought the Dalai Lama was, was Jewish. <laughs> Okay, so this is not, this is, you know, the professor, the typical professor, you know, complaining that people don't know what the prof professor knows, right? So, so why does this matter? You know, why does our collective illiteracy religiously matter? Um, and I would say it matters because religion matters. Religion obviously matters personally to billions of people uh, worldwide, to those who love Jesus, those who submit to Allah, those who observe the 613 uh, Jewish uh, commandments. But religion also has public power. It moves elections in India, and I would argue in the United States. It moves economies and military forces around the world. So religion may or may not make sense to you, but you can't make sense of the world without making sense of religion. It was in an attempt to address this problem that I wrote my religious literacy book. I focused in that book on religious illiteracy as a civic problem, which is to say not a problem of the liberal arts, which it is. If you don't know about the Bible and you go to the Getty Center and you look at uh, old paintings, as I, I did with my daughter the other day, uh, you really can't understand most paintings done in the West before 1950 without knowing something about the Bible because so many of them are biblical. So that's a liberal arts kind of problem. It's also a religious problem for evangelicals who want to raise their kids knowing something about the Bible or for Jews who want to raise their kids um, being Jewish. But I focused on religious illiteracy as a civic problem, a problem of American citizens and a problem to our politics. And I argued that there are really two directions or two vectors for this problem. One is at home domestically, where we now have two religious political parties, both of which speak the language of the Christian faith, quote the Bible to support their public policy initiatives. And we can't decide whether politicians are making sense when they argue, as Hillary Clinton did, for example, that on the basis of the Good Samaritan story, she would oppose Republican initiatives about immigration because those initiatives were asking us to turn in uh, people that we would see across the street who were foreigners, and what the Good Samaritan story told her was you didn't do that at all. You were supposed to take care of those, of those people. Um, and so she said, because of the Good Samaritan story, I can't support this initiative. Now, does this make sense? You can't really decide whether this makes sense unless you know something about the Bible. Uh, others who say, you know, I oppose Roe v. Wade, uh, I oppose abortion rights because the Bible is opposed to abortion. You know, does that make sense or not? 
Well, you don't know unless you know something about, uh, about the Bible. So I said that we have this uh, civic problem at home of religious illiteracy, but then we have a problem even more serious, I would argue, um, abroad. We can't understand the world in which we're trying to act as a nation unless we know something about Islam, unless we know something about Hinduism, unless we know something about Judaism, about Buddhism, and I should add about other forms of, of Christianity than those that are popular in the United States. And so I argued in that book for uh, mandatory public school courses on religion, one on the Bible to address our domestic side of this problem, and one on the world's religions to address the international side. And I included in that book a dictionary of religious literacy where I included about 100 terms such as uh, the five pillars of Islam or jihad, these sorts of things, and tried to define them in relatively compact ways that could be useful, that could be building blocks for, for religious literacy, which I understand to be the capacity to engage in an informed conversation about uh, religion. And I received a lot of emails and requests for a kind of follow-up book that, instead of making an argument about why we needed religious literacy, would actually provide religious literacy. And that's why I wrote this book I'm talking about today, God is Not One. I see two aims of this uh, book project. The first is to provide a primer of sorts on what I describe as the eight rival religions that run the world. So to provide basic information about these religious traditions. And when I was working on this book, my working title was The Great Religions. And I thought that since I was claiming these were great religions, I should decide which of them is the greatest. <laughs> because uh, that would make some people mad and that would be fun. <laughs> and so, uh, so I decided I wasn't going to do what is often done in books about the world's religions of, of presenting them in chronological order. This has the benefit that you can you know, tell a, a kind of narrative where you can refer back to the things you knew before. But I wanted each chapter to be freestanding so it could be read on its own. And so I decided to pose this question to myself. What's, which of these religions that I'm going to do is the greatest. And so I decided, in part, I must admit, to, uh, for reasons of provocation, that I would list Islam first as the greatest religion, followed by Christianity, and then by Confucianism. Those were my top three. And the, re the argument I made for why I should start with Islam was because uh, Islam is far and away the fastest growing religion in the world. If you look at data on numbers of adherents, uh, and you think about it in terms of, of uh, what in business you would call market share, right? How big of how much of the globe does each religion have in terms of its adherence? Now, Islam has grown over the last century from 11% of the world to 22% of the world. So its market share has almost doubled. And Christianity's market share over the same period has declined from 35% to 34%. So Christians are still one third of the globe, whereas Muslims are between a fifth and a quarter of the globe. So on that ground, you might say that Christianity is the greatest. But because Islam is growing so quickly and Christianity is in some ways receding, I thought that was an argument for Islam, starting first with Islam. The other reason was Islam is controlling the conversation now. If I'm on a, an airplane and somebody asks me what I do and I happen to tell them that I'm a religious studies professor, you know, 20 years ago, they would immediately change the subject. Um, you know, since 9-11, they want to talk to me about Islam. They don't want to talk to me about Christianity or any other religion. They want to talk to me about Islam. Uh, also, there's a good argument. This was made in a book maybe 15 or 20 years ago. Who's the most influential figure in world history? And the answer is clearly Muhammad. I mean, it's, on this, it's, it's, I don't believe it's close. You know, Muhammad was the uh, founder of Islam, obviously, but he was also the, the person who spread Islam all around the Arabian Peninsula. He was a jurist. He was the uh, patriarch of a large family. He was uh, a lawgiver. Uh, he was a military man. He was a prophet. So he combined really sort of Jesus, Paul, and Augustine all rolled into one inside uh, one religious tradition. I then also did uh, Hinduism, Buddhism, 
the Yoruba religions of West Africa, which come over to the New World in forms such as uh, Santeria, which you may have heard about in uh, Miami or New York or LA, and then Judaism and uh, Taoism. And I, I did also a brief coda on atheism, where I asked whether atheism is a religion. And uh, when we get to the Q&A, maybe someone will want to ask me whether I think atheism is a religion or not. And I presented uh, each of the religions, as I have for years in the classroom, via a four-part model where I ask, how do they define the human problem? How do they solve that human problem? What techniques do they commend to us for moving from the problem to the solution? And then who are the exemplars to which we can look to see how to make that, uh, make that move, make that transition? And so, for example, I would argue that the problem in Christianity, the human problem, is sin, and the solution is salvation from sin, and the techniques are faith or works or some combination, depending on whether you are a Protestant uh, or a Catholic, and then the exemplars would be Catholic saints or people of knights of faith, as Kierkegaard called them in the uh, Protestant uh, tradition, or in the Hindu tradition, the problem is samsara, the cycle of life, death, and rebirth, and the goal is to break out of that cycle of life, uh, death, and rebirth, and then there are various techniques for doing so in the Hindu tradition that divide the tradition into three broad categories, depending on whether the approach there is based on wisdom or devotion or, or um, moral action. And then there are exemplars such as the holy men that you might see wandering around India if you're inside that wisdom tradition of Hinduism or figures like Gandhi if you're inside the uh, action tradition of uh, Hinduism. The second aim of, uh, of the book, which I really want to talk about uh, more today, is uh, an argument. So I'm, I'm not just, and God is not one, trying to present these religions. I'm trying to make an argument about how they relate uh, to one another. And the argument is that religions are not the same. They're not essentially the same. Uh, that the gods that they worship are not one. The gods they worship are not the same. The gods they worship are not necessarily gods, and they don't even necessarily have gods in these traditions. And moreover, to believe that these religions are essentially the same is uh, untrue. As I just said, uh, it's condescending and it's dangerous. Other than that, this view is particularly perfectly fine. <laughs> Um, in college and graduate school, I heard repeatedly that religions were different paths up the same mountain. I'm sure you all have heard this idea. Uh, no one told me that uh, economic systems or political regimes were fundamentally the same. No one tried to convince me that capitalism and socialism were basically the same or that democracy really wasn't that different from monarchy except for that you know, king, queen thing. But um, when it came to Buddhism and Christianity and Hinduism, I was told that they were all essentially the same. And so, for example, Houston Smith, who published the most widely read primer on the world's religions, uh, writes, it is possible to climb life's mountain from any side, but when the top is reached, the trails converge. At base, in the foothills of theology, ritual, and organizational structure, the religions are distinct, but beyond these differences, the same goal beckons. I heard as well from Gandhi and from the Dalai Lama and from the popular religion writer Karen Armstrong all religions are, in essence, one. They may differ in, the, in essentials, but essentially they are the same. But I never uh, believed this. I never believed this because the religious people I knew, Protestants, Catholics, Jews, Muslims, affirmed very different beliefs, and they performed very different practices. The Christians I knew did not go on pilgrimage to Mecca. In fact, they weren't allowed to go on pilgrimage to Mecca. They didn't believe in the divine inspiration of the Quran. The Muslims and Jews I knew did not believe that Jesus was an incarnation of, of God. And most fundamentally, the religions disagreed on the mathematics of divinity. Is God one? Yes, say Muslims and Christians and Jews. But many Hindus say that there is more than one God. And many Buddhists say there are fewer than one God. 
Moreover, if you ask, the all religions are one people, sometimes referred to as perennialists of the perennial philosophy, if you ask them what or who is at the peak of their mountain, their answers differ from one another. So if you inquire of Gandhi, what do you find at the top of the mountain where all these religions are converging? converging? He would say God. He would give a doctrinal answer to the question, and he would tell you that what you find at the top of the mountain is God. If you ask Houston Smith as I read him, he would not give a doctrinal answer, he would give an experiential answer. And he would say that at the top of the mountain, there is the mystical encounter, the mystical experience of the human person with the divine, the awareness that the essence of the human person is not distinct from the essence of the divine. And if you ask Karen Armstrong and the Dalai Lama, they will not give you a doctrinal or an experiential answer to the question, they will say, that compassion is at the top of the mountain. This is an ethical response rather than a doctrinal or an experiential one. All religions are one because in essence they teach us to be compassionate toward one another. But the fact of the matter is that the world's religions start with very different analyses of the human problem and therefore strive toward very different goals. So it just isn't true that the beliefs and practices of the world's religions are essentially the same. But this view is also, as I said, condescending because it requires you to tell ordinary practitioners of these great religions that their beliefs or practices, beliefs and practices that they consider to be essential are somehow marginal and unimportant. To go to Houston Smith's metaphor, they are matters of the foothills rather than of the exalted mountaintop. So if a Christian friend tells you that Jesus was the only incarnation of God in human flesh and that he died on the cross to save you from your sins, then you need to uh, you know, pat him on the head and say that that's a, very, that's a very sweet idea, but that just isn't essential to Christianity. And if a Muslim friend tells you that the Quran is a warning urging every human being to submit to God by, among other things, praying five times a day and fasting during the month of Ramadan, then you need to uh, you know, pat her on the head and say, you know, that, that's very sweet, my good m Muslim friend, but that is not essential to the Islamic faith. You have misunderstood what Islam is essentially about. And I will tell you what is it essentially about. And so it goes for the seven sacraments of Catholics or the Ten Commandments or the Four Noble Truths of Buddhism. These things don't really matter because as the Hindu teacher and perennialist Swami Shivananda writes, the fundamentals or essentials of all religions are the same. There's difference only in the non-essentials. This is a lovely sentiment but it is, in my view, wishful thinking, and it has not made the world a safer place, which leads me to my third criticism of this idea. And that is that uh, this perennialist idea that the religions are the same has actually made the world more dangerous. How does it make the world more dangerous? Well, fundamentally, it makes us unable to understand the many conflicts of, around the world that are religiously inflected. How do we make sense of what's going on in Israel and the Palestinian territories if our guiding theory is that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are essentially the same? I suppose we could say that therefore the conflict there is economic and political, and that it can be understood in purely economic and political terms, and that religion doesn't need to be invoked for any sort of understanding or any sort of solution there. I think that's naive, because I think that most of the people in world history have been religiously motivated. And I think that that conflict is clearly religiously uh, inflected and needs a religious lens, in part, along with economic and political lenses, in order to be understood. And part of that understanding uh, needs to include the, the fact that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are different traditions with different values, different practices, different beliefs, different understandings of God, as well as similarities in all those areas. 
We can't understand what's going on in Burma without some understanding of the Theravada Buddhist tradition. We can't understand what's happening in, in uh, Tibet without some understanding both of Chinese Confucianism, I would argue, and also Tibetan Buddhism. And what about Kashmir, where we have two nuclear powers, the Hindu majority state of India and the Muslim majority state of Pakistan, staring each other down? How to make sense of Kashmir without knowing something about Hinduism and Islam? The idea that all the religions are the same also makes us unable to see the unique beauty of each of these religious traditions. Why learn about another religion if what you are going to learn is only what you have already learned in your catechism class as a Catholic or your Sunday school class as a Lutheran? If you want to understand what's happening with Israelis and Palestinians, it, it does not help to be told that Judaism, Christianity, and Islam are essentially the same. It doesn't serve diplomats or entrepreneurs working in India or China to be told that Hinduism and Confucianism are equal. It doesn't serve soldiers in Iraq or Afghanistan to be told that the Shia Islam of Iran is essentially the same as the Sunni Islam of Saudi Arabia. What we need today is not pretend pluralism. What we need is a clear-eyed look at the realities of the religions as they are, both toxic and tonic, both beautiful and ugly, both similar and different. As I see it, there are three widespread views about the world's religions. There is the clash of civilization views, view, which emphasizes difference and says that we have in our world an inherent and unavoidable clash between the Christian values of the West and the values of the Muslim world. There is the view I've been discussing mostly today, the perennialist view that all religions are one and true. And there is another view that represents, focuses on the similarities of religion. That's the view of the new atheists. All religions are the same and equally idiotic. In the end, I think that the clash of civilization people and the all religions are one people share something in common, a belief that where there is difference, there will necessarily be bloodshed. And I am more hopeful than that, and I also believe I am more realistic. Rather than beginning by lumping all religions together into one trash can or treasure chest, we must start, in my view, with a pragmatic understanding of the fundamental differences in belief and practices between the world's religions. There's a, a Taoist saying, the Tao has 10,000 gates, and it is up to each of us to find our own. To explore the great religions is to wander through these 10,000 gates. It is to enter into Hindu conversations on the logic of karma and rebirth, on Christian conversations, on the mechanics of sin and resurrection, and Taoist conversations on flourishing here and now, and perhaps, as Taoists argue, is possible flourishing forever. It is also to encounter rivalries between Hindus and Muslims in India, Jews and Muslims in Israel, Christians and Yoruba practitioners in Nigeria. The new atheists, see all religions, except their own anti-religious position, as the same idiocy, the same poison. The perennial philosophers see all religions as the same truth, the same compassion. What both camps fail to see is religious diversity. Rather than 10,000 gates, they see only one. One of the most common misconceptions about the world's religions is that they ask the same questions. They do not. Only religions that see God as all good ask how a good God can allow thousands to die in tsunamis. Only religions that believe in souls ask whether your soul exists before you are born and what happens to your soul after you die. What must I do to be saved is not a generic human question. It is a specifically Christian one. So, each of the great religions offers its own diagnosis of the human problem, its own prescription 
for a cure, its own techniques for reaching its religious goal, its own exemplars for emulation. Muslims say the problem is pride. Christians say salvation is the solution. Education and ritual are key Confucian techniques. And Buddhism, Buddhism's exemplars are the arhat or worthy one in the Theravada Buddhism of South and Southeast Asia, the Bodhisattva of compassion in the Mahayana traditions of East Asia, and the Lama in the Vajrayana or Tibetan Buddhist traditions. These differences, in my view, do not have to be devices. The cause of conflict in the world is not difference, religious or otherwise. Difference has always been with us. Humans have always been different from one another. The cause of our conflicts is an inability to manage difference. Every day across the world, human beings coexist peacefully in workplaces, in families, in classrooms with people who are very different from themselves. In New York City, Mets fans and Yankees fans actually live and work among one another. <laughs> they do, I've seen it. In Washington, D.C., Republicans and Democrats work amiably for the common good. Uh, uh, maybe not, sorry. Nonetheless, what we need when it comes to religion is not a dogma that they are the same. What we need are rituals for learning to get along amidst differences. And happily, we have resources inside each of the religions for this sort of peaceful coexistence. We have Muslims who told me when I visited Indonesia recently that Jews and Christians are like them, uh, people of the book. We have Christians saying, blessed are the peacemakers for they shall be called the sons and daughters of God. And we have Jews telling us that there's one God and therefore all human beings are part of one family. We also have examples in history outside of scripture of this sort of convivencia or getting along. We have almost a millennium in medieval Spain from 711 to 1492 of Jews, Christians, and Muslims collaborating in fields such as philosophy and astronomy and mathematics and architecture. Inside relationships and families, we all know that it is a recipe for disaster to pretend that everyone is the same. You know, what happy couple in this room has gotten along as husband and wife on the theory that they really are essentially the same. There really isn't any difference among them. That's what's required for a happy marriage. The goal is to acknowledge differences, to accept them, to learn from them, and perhaps even to uh, revel in them. So uh, let's return in conclusion to the story of the elephant, which has been interpreted, as I said, to teach us that all religions are parallel efforts to understand the same mysterious God. Because that isn't the only way to read the story. In fact, when I started researching this folktale, I learned that it demonstrates how different religions are, not how similar they are. Because it has been told and interpreted in various ways and put to various uses by various religious groups who disagree quite considerably about what the story means. Among Buddhists, the story shows that speculation on abstract metaphysical questions causes suffering. When you don't know what you're touching, it's best to be silent. <laughs> Remember the quarreling that ensued among the people who were shouting out, it's a snake, it's a fan. It's a pillar. They didn't know what they were talking about. They should have kept silent. Among Sufis, the mystical strain in Islam, the story of the elephant shows that God can be seen through the heart, but not through the senses. The senses mislead us. We touch 
and we draw erroneous conclusions about God. Why? Because God cannot be approached through the senses, but only through the heart. So say the Sufis. Hindus read it as a parable about how God can be reached by different paths. In fact, the, the popularity of the God is not one reading of this story is attributable to Hindu metaphysicians inside the Advaita Vedanta school of Hindu thinking that became very popular in the West, and particularly in places like Santa Barbara <laughs> and San Francisco in the 50s and 60s and 70s, through people like Aldous Huxley and Houston Smith and those folks. And they were influenced by their Hindu teachers who were Advaita Vedanta philosophers, and it's inside that school, one of six main schools of Hindu thinking that this parable is read in this way as an argument about the unity of all religions. Modern Western writers, such as the British poet John Godfrey Sachs, have turned this elephant story into a tale of the stupidity of doing theology. His poem on this uh, reads, so oft in theologic wars, the disputants I ween rail on in utter ignorance of what each other mean and prate about an elephant not one of them has seen. Why don't they just shut up already, he says. <laughs> For me, and this is my reading, the story is a reminder not of the unity of the world's religions, as Ramakrishna and the perennialists would have us believe, or of their shared stupidity, as Sachs and the new atheists would argue, but of the limits of human knowledge. It is commonplace to think of religions as unchanging dogmas demanding unqualified assent, and there are no doubt fundamentalists inside all religions who see things just this way. But one function of the transcendent is to humble us, to remind us that our thoughts are not the thoughts of God, to remind us that, at least for the time being, we see through a glass darkly. Yes, religious people offer solutions to the human predicament as they see it. Yet these solutions inevitably open up more questions than they close down. This is definitely true of the Rabbi Hillel, who perhaps more than any of the figures that I considered in God is Not One, followed Rilke's admonition to love the questions themselves. But it is also true of Muhammad, who once said, asking good questions is half of learning. And of Jesus, whose parables seem designed less to teach us a lesson than to move us to scratch our heads. When it comes to safeguarding the world from the evils of religion, including violence by proxy from the hand of God, the claim that all religions are one is no more effective than the claim that all religions are poison. Far more powerful is the reminder that religions, like the humans that inhabit them, are different. That is the place that any genuine study of religion must begin and any effort at interreligious understanding. So those are my, uh, my comments for today. Um, <laughs> we do have time for uh, questions. We have some, some microphones at, uh, uh, is there one there too? Yes? Okay, good, great. So uh, uh, please uh, address any questions you have to me or make any comments, as long as the questions aren't uh, difficult <laughs> and the comments are not critical, they will be, uh, they will be appreciated. Yes? I like studying religions. I like studying these belief structures. And my question um, that came up yesterday talking to a friend was, what, is it possible to live a life that doesn't have a belief structure? Like we look at religion because it can give us, I don't know, an illusion of control or stability. Can we live a life without a belief structure? And what would that look like? Great, uh, that's, a good, that's a great question. Um, I've actually never been asked that question. No, seriously, I mean, usually, usually I kind of know the question after five words. <laughs> well, it's a huge question. That's a huge question, right? I mean, I would, the way I would answer it 
it would be this. I mean, my first thought is no. You know, my first thought is no. Um, is it possible to live a life without any sort of belief? Um, I would say no, in the sense that all of us human beings are guided by uh, our understandings of the world, right? So, you know, one belief could, could be a kind of nihilism, right? We could be Nietzsche and we could, we could believe that God is dead and we could believe that there's no uh, transcendent reality and we then are going to be launched into either some kind of nihilistic madness or some kind of uh, nihilistic freedom or into some kind of existential um, posture that Sartre takes us to where what matters is the choices we make, right? But so those are uh, people who are living without the sort of beliefs in God or in the Christian Bible or in any of the, the religious traditions I've mentioned uh, in, in this lecture, um, and yet they have uh, beliefs to live by, right? So that's my sort of first order. But then my second order is that I do think that the life of the mind is not universal, right? So, um, so I mean, obviously there are, there are uh, you know, intellectuals and philosophers, right, who have this sort of the unexamined life is not worth living. But for most people in human history, I think uh, that hasn't been their motto. They've had a different motto, <laughs> right? And, and in the United States today, certainly there are many people who have a different motto, right? So, so if you just take someone who, uh, you know, is born and goes to school with the hope of getting a job and, and making money and uh, enjoying the sorts of things that America promises to people, and now, and now I mean consumer goods. Um, I wouldn't think that that life is particularly reflective, and I guess I would say that that life is uh, a life that's driven by the belief that owning consumer goods will make you happy. I think I would say that. I would say there's probably a guiding belief there. But if the person doesn't really think about it, that's a different sort of belief, right? That's a sort of unexamined belief. So maybe I would say that I think that people can live, I would argue people cannot live without guiding beliefs, but there are people who live by them in an examined way and people who live by them in an unexamined way. I think that's, that's the way I would answer the question. And then religions would be, you know, part of that. I think you have people who live in both those ways inside those religious traditions, right? And you have people who actually live by the religious teachings, but you have always throughout human history people inside each of these religions who don't really care or believe in all that much of what the religions teach either, right? Which is part of what makes one's job as a religious studies professor complicated. Because if you say, uh, oh, Catholics don't b believe in birth control, artificial birth control. And then you say, Catholics don't use artificial birth control. <laughs> then you're just lying to your students, because that's false. Because over 90%, I think the latest figure I saw was 95% of American Catholics use artificial birth control. And, and something like 90% of US Catholics have no problem with artificial birth control, so. Anyway, that's a long-winded answer to your excellent question that I don't have a very good answer to. Thank you.